A lot of people worry about how they're going to know when they're in labour. There are four things that normally indicate that labour is imminent. And sometimes um, they are things that make you want to ring the hospital straight away. And other times these things happen and you think, I'm just going to carry on pottering about my day. The big thing to really understand is it's absolutely fine to call the maternity ward whenever you want to. Even if you just want some reassurance that everything is progressing the way it should be, don't hesitate to pick up the phone. The midwives are there to guide you and support you through the whole process. So what are the four key things that normally give us an idea that labour is imminent? So the first thing that everybody thinks about is the onset of contractions. Contractions can start in a variety of different ways. Contractions can start as a low backache. They might start as period-like pains. They're probably going to come in waves. And you will feel a tightening and a certain pressure on your pelvic floor. They'll feel different from Braxton Hicks contractions and you will feel the difference. Everybody says that you just know, but they really do feel different from a Braxton Hicks contraction. You don't need to call the hospital straight away when you start having contractions. Um, if you feel comfortable at home, it's best to just carry on as you would have been anyway. If it's night time, try and get some rest. If it's daytime, maybe potter around your house, do whatever makes you feel comfortable. When you can feel your contractions forming a regular pattern and they're a few minutes apart, three to five minutes apart, then it's worth touching base with the hospital to let them know that your labour is beginning to get further guidance when they'd like you to pop along and see them. The other thing that everybody thinks about is waters breaking. Now, some people find that their waters break before the onset of contractions. And when your waters break, you do need to ring the hospital straight away. Waters break in a variety of different ways. Sometimes they go as a big gush, like we see in the movies. Other times they go as a trickle. And sometimes people worry about whether or not their waters have gone or whether or not they've wet themselves. And that's perfectly understandable. So if you're worried that your waters have gone, you'll find it's a constant trickle. It's worth putting a sanitary towel on and seeing if that trickle continues. Your waters should um, be clear or a pinkish colour and they won't smell the same as urine. So if you're unsure whether or not your waters have gone, I think it's still worth giving the hospital a little call. Other people experience sickness and diarrhoea in the days before um, they go into labour. This again is perfectly normal and it's your body's way of just getting ready to labour. You shouldn't have any other physical symptoms of illness, you shouldn't be running a temperature and you shouldn't feel systemically ill. So if you do feel ill, maybe you've got a stomach bug and it's worth checking in with your GP. If you've got no other signs of illness, maybe this means that your body's getting ready to labour and labour is imminent and might happen in two to three days. Again, absolutely fine to check in with your midwife or your GP if you're concerned. The other um, indicator that your body is preparing to labour is that you might have a show. A show is when you lose your mucus plug. The cervix is sealed by a plug made up of, of mucus. It does look like a big ball of snot. It's a sort of yellowy colour and sometimes it's flecked with some dark bits of blood. It should be sort of dark red brown blood. That again is nothing to worry about in itself. Absolutely fine to call the labour ward if you would like some reassurance. Um, but when you're having a show, it doesn't mean that you're in labour. It means that labour is imminent, might happen in the next sort of two to five days. Around about 15 to 25% of births in the UK are started by what's called an induction of labour which is where a midwife or a doctor helps to start the early stages of your labour. This is done with a hormone called prostaglandin, which is either offered as a pessary or what looks like a very thin tampon called propess. Now, the different options will vary compared to where you may deliver your baby, but they're trying to do the same method, which is to start to soften and shorten the cervix surrounding your baby. Once the cervix becomes thin and begins to open, your own hormones can kick in and start allowing your body to labour. Now the induction process can be a lengthy process. 
It can take less than 24 hours or it can take more than 48 hours. And that's just because you and your body and your baby may be not quite ready for labour and we have to replicate the slow build-up that your body would have at home. Throughout the induction, your midwife will monitor you and your baby and talk you through the options of what the induction means and what methods will be offered throughout that induction process. At Ipswich, we have a suite called the Nova Suite, which is where you'll start your induction journey. You'll be phoned on the date that you'll be given to start your induction process. And when the ward allows, you'll be invited into the hospital. There, the midwife will monitor you and your baby and assess down below to see what your cervix is like before the induction process. Once they've given you the induction method, and this is given through the vagina, then the induction process can begin. So once your cervix has become thin and open, your midwife or the doctor can offer what's called an ARM, which means an artificial rupture of membranes. They do this by passing through a small hook between the midwife or doctor's fingers called an amni hook. This looks like a small crochet hook that may be curved and it has a very small hook at the end of it. This sits between the midwife's fingers and during a contraction or during an examination, the hook is popped through the bag of waters around your baby and the waters are released, allowing a big surge of your natural oxytocin. And hopefully that will begin to start your labour. So the midwife will discuss with you a length of time to see if your contractions start to start by themselves or maybe you need some more support in your induction process. So the next thing they will offer you is something called syntocinon, which is a synthetic form of your oxytocin that surrounds your body in birth. Now this is introduced to the body very slowly with a tube that goes into either your hand or your wrist And over the next four to six hours, you'll slowly begin to produce some surges, some waves. And gradually, over time, very slowly, your body will start to contract. And maybe that eventually you might be having contractions about every two to three minutes apart. Once your body starts to recognise this hormone, sometimes your own hormones then kick in and we can lower the use of the hormone drip to allow your own hormones to flow and hopefully that's all your body will need for then your labour to begin and for your labour to birth just as it would do if you went into labour yourself. If you have been offered an induction during your pregnancy do ask your midwife or your doctor to explain this process thoroughly before you begin just so it takes that fear away from that process and know that it is very similar to how you would birth and begin your birth at home. It's just in a different location. The cervix and how it dilates. The cervix is the neck of the uterus, behaves just like a muscle and it hangs down into your vagina. It's about three centimetres long. It has length to it. We often forget this. Everybody thinks that the cervix just dilates from naught to 10 centimetres, but actually it has this sort of length to it as well. Before the onset of labour, the cervix is fairly hard. It's stiff, it's cartilagey. It feels like the end of your nose. When you begin to go into labour or before the onset of the first contractions, you start producing some hormones called prostaglandins and prostaglandins soften the cervix. It's at that point when your baby's head makes contact with the cervix that you start producing oxytocin, which is going to draw up those fibres of the cervix and lift them up and out of the way. This is when we have to remember that the cervix has this length to it. It's very common for women to get to hospital to have their first first vaginal examination, find out they're only one or two centimetres dilated and to feel a little bit disappointed with progress. But if you imagine the cervix does have this three centimetres worth of length to it, If you get to hospital and you find out you're one or two centimetres dilated, you've done lots and lots of really great work because your cervix has flattened out, it's become really thin and it's begun to open. You've made a huge amount of progress. 
we have to think about the relationship between our cervix and your baby's head. And that's why we have this doll. So this doll has the perfect shaped head. He has a long sloping part to his head here and he has a little round, rounded part of his head here. This part of the head is called the occiput part of the head and it's that part of the head that we want to have nestling down on the cervix. Imagine the cervix is the palm of my hand. So if the occiput part of the head is putting lots and lots of pressure on the cervix, that is what's going to stimulate your body to produce oxytocin. Every time your baby's head presses on that prostaglandin, softened cervix, you release a spurt of oxytocin. That stimulates your uterus to surge forwards and relax backwards. That presses your baby's head down onto the cervix again and your uterus will surge forwards and relax backwards. And you fall into this lovely cycle where your baby's head is pressing on the cervix, you're releasing oxytocin, it's just stimulating a contraction which is pressing your baby's head down on the cervix again. It's the pressure of your baby's head on the cervix that helps draw those fibres up and out of the way to make space for your baby to be born. Your baby's head literally pushes the fibres away. It's exactly the same as when you pull a jumper over your head. It's the pressure of your head that pulls those fibres of the neck of the jumper over your head and your baby's head does the same thing to your cervix. There's no force or resistance. The cervix gently stretches around your baby's head until it moves out of the way. Dilation is measured in centimetres and you go from 0 to 10 centimetres. We're going to look at our stacking cups now to see how that happens. So once your cervix is flattened out um, and is fully effaced, you begin to dilate. You go from one centimetre, two centimetres, three centimetres, four centimetres, all the way up to about 10 centimetres. Not everybody dilates to 10 centimetres and some people dilate a little bit further. Dilation is very much an organic process. And according to the book, you dilate half to one centimetre for every hour that you're in labour. And this leads us to believe that you should dilate in this perfect curve from one all the way up to 10. But that very rarely happens. People dilate in a whole range of different ways. Some people start off relatively slowly. Things might speed up a little bit in the middle. Maybe things will slow down a bit again somewhere. Might speed up again towards the end. Other people go through phases where they dilate really, really slowly and have a sudden spurt. It's gonna be different for everybody. So there's no point ever watching the clock and thinking I should have dilated a certain amount by this time. It just doesn't work like that. The next thing that we need to consider is how the cervix opens. And if we look at our stacking cups, it gives us a beautiful idea that this cervix might start opening from the centre and open out towards the edges. But it doesn't happen like that either. You dilate from the back of your body towards the front. So there's always more of a lip of cervix towards the front of your body than there is at the back. And this is why it's so important to be mobile during your labour. If you're lying flat on your back, on a bed, you'll find there's a point where your baby's head no longer makes contact with the cervix. And that means that your diet rate of dilation would slow down and eventually your labour might stall. So this is why we always talk about how you should rotate, dilate or move to improve during your labour. The midwife will see how dilated you are by performing a vaginal examination. This is a standard part of hospital protocol. It's, it's offered routinely. And normally you are checked every four hours during uh, four hours that you were in labor. It is very much your choice. You have, don't have to consent to having vaginal examinations, but I would suggest if you really feel very strongly about not having them, you have that conversation with your midwife before the onset of labor. When a midwife performs a vaginal examination, she inserts two fingers into the vagina and she's looking to see uh, whether or not there's any length left to your cervix, how stretchy it is, um, whether or not she can fit a finger inside the cervix. If she can fit one finger inside, you're one centimetre dilated, two fingers, you're two centimetres dilated, three centimetres, you're three centimetres dilated and so on. It's um, really important not to get too hung up on these measurements and relating that to how long the rest of your labour is going to take. Because 
we don't want to be sort of watching the clock and thinking, oh, I've been in labour for you know, eight hours now, I should be eight centimetres dilated. It doesn't always work like that. We know from the stacking cups that sometimes you, uh, your dilation will speed up, maybe it will slow down for a little while, and maybe it will speed up again at the end. What we also know is that if we increase the pressure of our baby's head on the cervix, it's going to help us dilate until there's no remaining cervix left at the front of your body. When you rock your hips from side to side, you are gently rocking your baby's head backwards and forwards against the cervix. If you roll your hips round in a circle or rotate, you're helping push any last remaining little bit of cervix out of the way. And this is why we talk about moving to improve your labour or rotating to dilate. The important thing to remember is that your body is designed to move during labour and upright positions where you're moving are going to really help your baby's head connect with the cervix, push the fibres out of the way and increase the amount of oxytocin that you're producing. The latent phase or the early first stage of labour can be quite frustrating. Technically, according to the book, it's when you're between 0 and 3 centimetres dilated, but you probably don't know that because you're probably still at home. It's absolutely fine to check in and call the hospital whenever you want to, even if it's just for a little bit of reassurance and guidance. The latent phase um, is uh, typically the latent phase is when contractions are sporadic. They might be far apart. They're probably not forming any particular pattern and you can carry on chatting through them normally. They're not particularly intense. You're reaching a sort of more established phase of labour when those contractions become intense enough to make you stop and breathe. Maybe you won't be able to chat through them anymore. So the contractions will vary in strength at this time. You may find the latent phase lasts quite a long period of time and it's very easy to get frustrated, but you have to remember all the contractions are doing something. They're probably helping your cervix to efface, to um, become shorter and flatter until it becomes as thin as tissue paper. During the latent phase, it's really important to try and rest as much as possible. If it's night time when you start beginning to get contractions, try and rest, try and go back to sleep. If you can't do that, do something that's relaxing, maybe, you know, watch film. Leave your birth partner to rest as well because you're going to need more of their support later on in your labour. During the latent phase, you want to make sure you keep your body well fueled absolutely fine to carry on eating and drinking normally but try not to eat anything too heavy because your digestive system will slow down. It's also really important to try and control the flow of adrenaline. This phase of labour is quite exciting. You're getting really excited about the fact that you're going into labour and you're going to meet your baby soon and you probably find that your heart begins to pound a little bit when you think about it and your breathing gets a little bit shallower. That's the adrenaline in action. And the best way to cope with the latent phase contractions is to use a really simple breathing technique that we call the basic birth breath. And this is where you breathe in for the count of four and out for the count of eight. These are long, slow, deep breaths. If you feel your heart beginning to flutter, just try using that big deep breath in for four and out again for the count of eight. You can use that breathing technique all the way through this phase of labour, breathing in as you feel your uterus contract and out as you feel the contraction ebbing away. You can also use a little bit of movement if you want to. You don't have to be charging up and down your stairs, you don't want to wear yourself out, but if you use more upright positions, you're going to increase the amount of pressure from your baby's head on that cervix and hopefully increase the amount of oxytocin that's flowing around your body, which is going to help your labour advance as much as possible. When it comes to knowing when to go to hospital, this varies from person to person. Some people might have quite a long journey to hospital and therefore want to get there earlier in their labour. Other people want to stay at home for as long as they can. And the home environment is ideal. It's where you're going to feel most relaxed. It's where you're most likely to produce the most oxytocin. And you're not going to feel those surges of adrenaline coursing around your body. Absolutely fine to call the maternity unit and check in whenever you want to, even if it's just for a little bit of reassurance. Generally, you want to be experiencing two to three contractions every 10 minutes when you call the maternity unit and let them know that you're coming in. In terms of how you're behaving when you get towards the more established stage of labour, you'll find you're probably chatting less. Hopefully your partner's going to notice a few changes in your body language. You tend to become a little bit more introverted. 